Dingo, we're back. It's the one o'clock rock on a given Monday, every Monday, research in Manoa. Um, and with us, we have our old friends, Jeff Taylor and Linda Martell of the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology in SOWEST. That's the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. We'll be giving you a short examination at the end of the show <laughs> about various acronyms like that. Welcome to the show, you guys. Uh, Thank good you. To be back. Hi. Great to see you here. Great to have you back. And the title they settled on, which I agree with and endorse wholeheartedly, is The Value of Space Research to Earthlings. From space to Earth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and this all begins with the notion of why do we care? I love to ask that question. Why do we care about what you guys are doing in and the research you're doing about space? <laughs> Let the record reflect a long silence. <laughs> well, I was waiting to say, Lynn, I wanted no, to go, go first. You go ahead. I think um, it really helps us understand our place in the universe. You know, we're part of something much bigger. And we can, in our daily lives, get all wrapped up in for example, a recent experience getting to the parking structure in downtown Honolulu <laughs> <laughs> when you don't come down here that often and, and wrapped up in all these little things and getting the kids to school and so on. But in fact, you know, we are part of a, of a, a beautiful island chain on a beautiful blue planet in a dynamic solar system that's one of many. And just to understand that. And it supports life. That's the thing about it. Whatever it does, it yes. actually, not every place uh, supports no, life. No, and we're yeah. finding most, many, so there are other places that will support, could support life, but m many solar systems do not have planets yeah. in the right place. So we're lucky. We're to see that this is sort of a one-time only type of deal. They call it the Goldilocks, you know, uh, position. Uh, just yeah. far enough away from the sun to be good, not too far away, yeah. not too hot, not too cold. Yeah, it's yeah. Do you, special. Do you believe in uh, extraterrestrial beings up there? Do you believe in that? <laughs> well, I didn't think I was going to get that question. Uh, no, I don't really think right. so. <laughs> no. it's, it's too remarkable. <laughs> You know, ma mankind, humankind is too remarkable. Life, mammalian life, life mm. is a wonderful thing, but it isn't everywhere. And we don't, we don't really have evidence that it exists anywhere else. We do me. not yet have evidence that there's any microorganisms anywhere else. Yeah. It's likely there is m microorganisms, but this whole evolutionary chain to lead to, to intelligent beings. That's a long this shot. This is, yeah. 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 Well, I, I want to go one step further than, you know, you went about a beautiful island chain in a beautiful blue planet in a, in a, you know, a dynamic solar system, all of which supports life. I said, it's great to get away from a world that is becoming increasingly fragmented. Yeah. So, you know, we had a show about the, the headlines, unpleasant headlines in Europe and, and in this country, too. And in the world today, we are fragmented. There's all kinds of headaches going on, frustrations. The, the news is not good news. But if you look to the heavens, you have a moment of respite. That's why people have found deities up there, mm -hmm. right? Deities are always up there because you can get away from all the trouble on, on the surface. Yeah, and the sense of them looking back on us. Yeah. It also gives us a different perspective on the Earth. You know, the picture of the whole Earth, in fact, space. like our uh, picture number one, is, is just magnificent. And, you know, back in the 70s, late 60s, 70s, I think the environmental movement was given a big boost by the first by this pictures, picture, by this, this NASA picture. kind of picture here. This yeah. is a newer one, newer version of it, taken yeah. by the Lunar Reconnaissance Observer. Yeah. But it is looking back to see this, this amazing place in space, and, and all by itself, you know, and the further away you get from it, you realize that we are on our own. Yeah. And it would be nice if all those intelligent beings down there acted somewhat more intelligently. From this perspective, <laughs> you, you don't see those country lines. Yeah, there's no country yeah, lines. No country yeah. lines on that. No. You see oceans no. you have you to see, take care yeah. of in the land. Yeah, and the ice cap seems smaller, though. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. wish more people would think about the Earth this way, as a whole. Yeah, yeah. As a, yeah. And this photograph, or well, this kind of photograph, the NASA style of photograph, really should be an inspiration to us all. And it should make us think those thoughts. 
Yeah, and the whole, I like the whole idea of, of the planet as an integrated system. And you know, we study the other planets that way. Mars and Venus are so, because they have atmospheres, a really complex interaction the atmosphere and the ground, the rocks, and this volcanism and so on. And the moon and Mercury are a little calmer in that respect, but they still have big complex interacting histories. And the Earth, it's, it, one of the things that may have led to us is the fact that it is so dynamic. Yeah. That there are recycling of the atmosphere, recycling of ocean sediments, there's new ocean basins forming all along. That's why the Hawaiian So you islands. get stresses, and the stresses <laughs> ultimately result in um, differences, and mutations, yeah. if you like, of, of, the, of the life. Ridges. So look yeah. what we have, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, how much progress have we made, scientifically, technologically, since, uh, say, 19, what was it, 1969? when uh, we had the first walk on the moon, how much progress have we made? Do we know a lot more? How much more do we know now? Oh, we, we know a tremendous amount more. In, including uh, even like things about the ozone layer and our climate, we, we global do. issues. Well, you know, we, didn't, we never knew not that we really, truly, completely are sure that we know now where the moon came from, but it's been up there. It's big in the sky. It's the brightest and biggest thing in the sky. And, and you wonder about that. How did it get there? What's it like? Was it, does it have, did it have oceans? The answer is no. Uh, <laughs> uh, and what, what ever is have it like? Oceans. What is it like? And I, I think we learn things from little events to big events. And in fact, we even have an example of, in that slide, oh, there it is. See that arrow? Uh-huh. Down that's the, middle, the yeah. Apollo 17 landing site there at the lower middle bottom. Uh -huh. And there's letters on it that SM is South Massif and NM is North Massif. And the SH is the Sculptured Hills. Those are geologic units around this site that the, we hoped that the astronauts would be able to sample. They are deposits from big impact events. The, um, the two big basins are way bigger than Texas in their size and at least two of them contributed materials to this site. And we went there to try to understand not only the smooth plains that this valley is filled with, but also the, the mountains. How old are they? How, are they really from those big basins? When the basins form? And, and one of the most interesting things at this landing site are big boulders, like in number three. Linda just wrote an article in our web magazine uh, about these boulders, and they made tracks as they rolled down the hill, oh, and so the crew could know where they came from. In fact, these are this is two of the boulders, but they came down as one piece. It appears. Or so this this image was taken by astronaut Cernan of astronaut Schmidt on this last Apollo mission to the moon. So these are the last two humans on the moon, <coughs> and the boulders had fallen down from a, a big slope, and it let them uh, sample those rocks. But look at the size of the boulders in relation to, to the astronaut who's, who's standing there by the, by the yeah. rover. Is that common, the boulders like that? I mean, you can find them all over? On the rims of craters and downhill slopes like this, yeah. Especially on fresh craters. Oh, this is the, the abundant boulders. Now look at that. So you see that streak that's kind of going up to the top of the picture? Those, that's the track of the original boulder that was rolling down that. Uh, it's been there 20 million years, that boulder track. <laughs> that's not moving time. very quickly. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, not it came, now. It did come down quickly. I mean, it just stopped. I mean, that's, oh, that's the stopped. track. That track is 20 million yes. years old. Yes. Yeah, so it, it was a single event of a boulder rolling downhill but if you were down in the valley, you would not have heard it. Yeah. <laughs> why, why, why did it stop? Oh, I think it, it, the slope changes and it gets a little um, um, more horizontal and it, it just came to a stop. It broke up, this big boulder broke up, but then just, you know, landed. Um, what just kind like, of event? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, it just was a, it was just a boulder falling down a, a yeah. cliff 20 million years ago. Why, why did it roll in the first place? What event, what kind of event might have started it off? You know, you don't know. 
or on the Earth, landslides would develop, but you have a lot of rain, it's not rainy on the moon. Um, earthquakes can cause it. In the case of the moon, a little meteorite impact can cause it. And other times, you know, the, there's, uh, uh, it gets very cold at night and very hot in the day in the equatorial zones there, and maybe the stress is enough over millions of years to crack it, and there's enough gravity on the moon to have this thing roll down. Okay, so this, this opens the question again. Why do I care? Why do I care about this boulder? Well, how is this boulder affecting my life, my community, my earth, you know, anything that I do? Why do I care about this boulder? Um, first, you, you, answer, what you need to say is, let me get back to you about that, Jay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, first, just to continue the boulder a bit more, and then we'll then, then I'll talk about it. It's a um, uh, Schmidt was astronaut Schmidt was stood in the boulder, in one of the these boulder tracks. So if we can see that picture again of him, this that last picture, yeah. I would just want to read you while they were on the surface. Um, astronaut Schmidt, who you see in the picture, says um, a little earlier before this time, hey, this boulder's got its own little track right up the hill across the contour. And he says to the other astronaut, I'm, gonna, I'm standing in the boulder track. How does that make you feel? And the other astronaut says, oh, that makes me feel like I'm coming over to do some sampling. And then he says, oh, think how it would have been if you were standing there before that boulder came by. <laughs> and Schmidt says, I'd rather not think about it. And that's what they're talking about while they're out there. Because that, that picture is actually two boulders, one in front of the other, but they're huge. <laughs> but they're huge, but they're not round. So, you know, you wonder no. how they could roll, because they would have had to roll, right? Roll, tumble, yeah. something. Break up. Well, next time we have a landslide on Oahu, and we will. Uh, rush okay. out to where it covers the road, and you'll see most of the rocks are busted up and they, they end up angular. Even though they may be from a weathered hillside that's kind of roundish, but the stuff underneath is still fairly angular. And on the moon, even more angular because there's no, no water processes to start, start yeah. uh, it's kind of softening Maybe Some up kind of earthquake event. Must Something have. driven it down. And what's cool, this happened, we do know this from dating, a uh, uh, certain kind of isotopic dating of, of the samples, including from the boulder tracks, and it happened like 20 million years ago. And that's, so Schmidt was studying an event, big boulder rose downhill 20 million years ago. The boulder itself has the, formed about 3.9 billion years, billion years ago in a big event that made a base on the moon that is way bigger than Texas like uh, 900 miles to 1,000 miles across, the, depending on the, where you put the rim. And this is big. And there is evidence from lunar samples that we had all 50 of these size basins, actually it's 40 something, um, form in a short time period that could be only a few hundred million years. If the moon, <laughs> here's the importance of it, if the moon is like that, the Earth was bombarded too in its early history. And what did that do to, could it have delayed the onset of life? Could it have actually made little niches of where life could have developed because it added heat to the system? Those are things we don't know. Well, of course, and could it happen again? Could it be bombarded <coughs> it in can, the same way again? Not by a whole bunch of them like that. Because I think we know where things are and they're not on orbits that would do that unless there's some other kind of odd big event. A single event, like this Chicxulub crater in uh, Mexico that, that killed dinosaurs. Yeah, I'd heard about that. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, we could, uh, that's a, is a manageable event. We could probably deflect an asteroid if we would actually really work on doing that. One more question before we leave the, the moon and the boulders is, uh, so, the, so it's a smaller object, the moon is smaller, not as much gravity because it's not, not as much mass. So the boulder doesn't weigh as much on the moon. Yeah. So how does that affect things? Does that make it roll faster or slower? Um, does that plant it firmly where it is? Or does it make it unstable for further events because of the light gravity? The stability is, in, in this case, it probably doesn't matter because it ends up kind of on a flat grounds. Yeah. But, but the, 
the falling down, it, it would roll slower, just like if you drop something, it falls slower. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it, it, and it, but on the other hand, it might have taken longer to get it started. If that same boulder was in the same kind of hill on the earth, it probably would have rolled sooner. And I don't, I, I don't yeah. know. But yeah. you know what's interesting thing is the, the, the landing slide has a big landslide too. What's interesting is, is here's a process that happens on earth, but what's the difference on the moon? It has no atmosphere, smaller gravity, and are, is the process the same, or is, does this happen on the Earth in some cases, but a lot of times it really hel helped by water flowing with it? You know, all these things. It makes you look at the whole process of boulders falling downhill. Yeah. I have this image of that astronaut, you know, at the time when the boulder was actually coming, and he sees it coming down to him. It's moving a little slower than it would move on Earth. <laughs> And it's lighter than it would be on Earth. He puts his hand up oh. like <laughs> Superman and stops it right there. Just like we're going to stop this show for one minute while we take a break. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with Think Tech Hawaii, and I'd like to ask you to come watch my show, The Economy in You, each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha, this is Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We're here to inform, motivate, and entertain you. Join us. Hola, soy Maria Mera, y estoy aquí para invitaros a mi show bilingüe, Viva Hawaii en Think Tech Hawaii, cada dos lunes a las 3 de la tarde. Estamos aquí para informaros, motivaros, y entreteneros. Apuntaros. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. We're back. That was a relief, eh? Okay, we have, we have Jeff Taylor and Linda Martell of the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at SOWEST, and we're talking about the value of space research to mere Earthlings. Okay, really interesting, provocative stuff. So, you know, this, you know, I like history, the study of history. We have plenty of history on these shows because it is like time travel. As you put yourself in, it's the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's yeah. Court. How would life be if I was back there, what, four or five hundred years ago? Well, how would life be if I was back there 200 million years ago? <laughs> yeah. So you got time travel big time when you study this kind of planetology. Yeah, yeah it really is a, it's, it's, it's what attracted me to it, is the idea you could find out uh, some about events that happened in the case of planetary science billions of years ago and it's just so it's so exciting and then you can hold in your hands rocks the, the lunar samples we have the youngest the typical youngest rock is about three billion years old well that's really old pretty old and actually. you know that from carbon dating no for, well, from radioactive dating yeah radioactive that, dating. That can you take a minute and, and describe how that works how, how do, well, there, is, how do there I are tell? a few radioactive elements that just decay at a constant rate uh, and defined by a half-life, but they decay at a constant rate and they make a product and you can measure both the product and the radioactive element and through a decay equation figure out how long that process was going on. There are complexities to it, which is why we hire very nerdy technical people to do that work. <laughs> here? I mean, fine people, fine interesting people. Here? here? Fine nerdy. It happened here in Hawaii? Oh, yeah. oh yes, yes. Was that right? Had yeah. the equipment and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why you love to get your hands on space rocks. Space rocks. Because that will tell you so much. Yeah, and, and in the case of the moon, uh, more than even dating it, there are the whole outer part of the moon, the highlands of the moon, we call them, the white areas when you look at it. Those are composed of dominantly one mineral uh, called feldspar, a, specific, a particular type of it. There's, the geologists do like to name things. We'll try to avoid some of them. <laughs> feldspar is, makes up about 45% uh, probably of Hawaiian basalts. It's a common mineral. But to concentrate so much of it, uh, an idea came from the very first samples examined in a, during, from the Apollo 11 mission from a little white 
rocks in what was a dark pile of rock, of, of basalt pebbles. And it's, uh, it's one way of doing it is to, to melt, have a magma and the plagioclase sinks or floats, and in the case of the moon, floated to the top and made a, a, a crust of this stuff that's like 30, 40 kilometers deep, all composed of mostly of this mineral. And it was a shock. And, and, and then subsequent missions showed that, well, yeah, this crust actually does have all this uh, feldspar in it. And even though there was some skepticism at first, but then it's, the idea really took hold and it's called the magma ocean hypothesis. And for the first time, we thought, uh, as is depicted here, yeah. see the molten moon on the left, and then it's partially crystallized where dense minerals sank and form uh, the layer is not actually green because it's so hot, but the mineral you take from it when it cools is green. And, <laughs> and then finally, the feldspar crystallizes and makes a crust. And this said that that planet formed really hot and maybe the Earth did. And up until that time, everyone had the Earth, the geologists had the Earth forming cold, heating up, and had very elaborate theories as to how long it took, when the core formed, and so on. And this said, well, maybe everything starts hot. And ever since then, everything has started hot you know, for planets. And that, and that goes to this whole question is uh, of why do we care? Because if you, 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 you know, you, you're talking about running a kind of parallel uh, analysis on what's happening in space and, uh, and finding out how, how things work, how, how geology works, because that's all there is out there, geology, and, uh, and physics, I suppose. And then you take those lessons and maybe you can find parallels on the Earth. Um, and, but how frequently do you find parallels on the Earth that you can actually use for something? Oh, uh, we do a lot of Comparative planetology it even has a name, so it must be uh, CP. Yeah, <laughs> with, with, with the moon and Mars and Venus and Mercury and and, and even little and asteroids. Solid asteroids yeah. melted and almost many almost completely melted when they formed uh, four and a half billion years ago. And I, we did, you try to put it all together into a story of the Earth through time. And you know we don't have much of a direct record of the Earth four and a half billion years ago because it was it's so geologically active you lose much of this record yeah. but the other planets have that record and we do see some evidence from uh, the early history of mars it was very hot very geologically active the moon was venus is kind of too geologically active to see that but there's nothing like being there isn't it i mean you need to actually like these astronauts you have to go there and look and touch and apply sensors and testing equipment that you know, uh, a sort of a scientific analysis by people who may come up with some new thing they want to learn while they're there. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's, the question I put to you is, don't you think that in, it's, this is like going down to the bottom of the ocean. At one point, we had all these ways where human beings could go down to the bottom of the ocean. Now we focus more on technology to go down to the ocean, bottom of the ocean. Isn't, isn't the likely result, because of the, the time difference, you know, the need to travel for long periods of time, isn't it going to result in automated research on these foreign planets somewhere? Mm -hmm. no. I think there's a combination. Yeah, a combination, yeah. I think so, uh, too. That there are some things you might just as well send, if, if they're a simple task, especially early, like if you want to build a base on the moon, the earliest things you want to do are really the Stone Age thing, right? You build habitats from the local material, this can be done robotically. Once you have more complex things there and you want to design it so people can live there and work there and figure out how to use space materials to do even grander voyages like to Mars, uh, that's one way of doing it. The other way is to find out. If you're gonna go, if you really want to go to long missions like to Mars and beyond, you have to understand the space environment and the effect on people which is why the space station is so useful and, is, and I think underappreciated. It's a, it's a gigantic structure up in space. Yeah. And uh, it's, the volume of it is uh, bigger than, a, I think, a 767 interior altogether, counting all those little modules mm -hmm. that go off. And there have been done, done a lot of really interesting experiments have, have been done.
You know, I mean, the, from time to time, it goes, it's, it goes back into the literature of the 20th century anyway, when people first realized the possibilities of going there and being there. And, uh, uh, the notion of creating habitats on the moon or elsewhere uh, and in space stations where you'd stay for an indefinite, and it wouldn't only be scientists. It would yeah. be ordinary people. Yeah. It would be the big getaway. Right. Yeah. This, this has got to be a, a repeating theme <laughs> yeah. in our literature. The, the, the big getaway mm -hmm. when it's out of Superman, where where the Krypton, the, the planet yeah. Krypton blows up. Remember, yeah. and so he comes to Earth because there's nothing left of Krypton. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what about that here? I mean, we are abusing this planet at a rapid rate. One day it may just you know implode, and, and it won't be a, a place where we can live. We who we who were born here may have to go. I mean, is there any real possibility that we could survive on a planet where we, you know, didn't evolve? Can we survive on the moon? Wouldn't that be too expensive? You know, but not if you that. first, not if you have to. <laughs> and because <laughs> uh, price is proportional to yeah. the demand. I mean, the but it's also not if um, if you use the materials that are there, one of the problems, the Apollo program, fabulously successful. And since then, we've tried to follow that model where you bring everything with you. Well, that's, we didn't do that exploring uh, anywhere else. You know, the, the Hawaiians did not arrive here with 1,300 years worth of food on their canoes. Uh, <laughs> it was, it, you get there and you use what's there. Now, the moon's a tad on the barren side, and so is Mars, but nevertheless, there's materials there. You can build greenhouses, and you can grow stuff in lunar dirt. They did that with Apollo dirt huh? as part of the protocol to make sure there were not uh, 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 earthling killing germs in the materials. So I think you can uh, do it. Well, what, what do you see? We only have a minute left, and I wanted to get your guys' take on what do you see as ultimately the best case analysis you know, are coming out of, emerging out of our space research, space exploration. That is for us, for the planet, for humanity. What is the best result we could achieve? What do you think about as scientists who look into this? I think, well, I think about um, the different medicines and things that they're probably being able to uh, create in that microgravity environment mm. in the space station. And also uh, energy production, trying to use maybe the moon as a place to um, send solar energy back to, back to the Earth. Oh, interesting, yeah. Yeah, there are interesting possibilities for, for energy for the Earth from the moon. And, and they haven't been explored in enough, that we haven't done a demonstration project, and that's what we really need to do. It sounds so grandiose, but you know, we, we are still burning fossil fuels like mad, uh, yeah. and the amount is increasing. China's building uh, Earth is 20 online, a new coal-fired plant, one per week, and so it's, it's going to get worse. Yeah. So we have to do, we have to be able to do something uh, to, 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 to first, uh, save our planet, give energy that's clean, and there are uh, a couple of possible possible ways of doing that. The other thing is space. By traveling in space, it's a whole different environment. And um, my friend Don Pettit, I just spent Fourth of July weekend uh, on the Big Island. He was on vacation. He's an astronaut. Been up in the space station for almost a year, all in two different trips. And he pointed out that that the, the experiments. The greatest experiment is astronauts themselves, <laughs> with bone density loss. With uh, there's there are eye problems that develop, and and how many of these things really help us understand the way the human body works? And yeah. I, I think we can we can make progress by studying humans in space. Don pointed out to me that you know when you do experiments with uh, uh, Earth uh, Earth animals of life in any form, no matter what you do, you, you decrease the amount of water, increase sunlight, you always have gravity the same. But the space station, has that factor has changed by a factor of a million. And what does it do to us and what does that tell us about how the body works? Yeah, we and could learn. We yeah. are learning. Mm -hmm. Yes, we actually are learning. Thank you. Jeff Taylor, 
Linda Martell, thanks for coming down from HIGP at SOWEST at UH Manoa. We're only beginning this discussion. Yeah. <laughs>